And just while we're waiting, this is Chago. He's going to feature in a bunch of the slides that are my personal photos because I've been working with him for years and years. Um, and he is um, a great Pyrenees, at least in part. He might also have some marima in him. Um, and he has been a working livestock guardian dog for, oh gosh, at least 10 years. Um, we're his third home, so I don't know really anything about his origins, and I don't know exactly how old he is. Um, but he's getting to be a, a senior gentleman who's really kind of seen it all and done it all. Um, so he'll he'll be our our test case today. Um, and okay, let's see. We're at twelve o two, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. <laughs> okay. Um, and y'all feel free to um, drop your questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A um, as they come up um, in, in this discussion. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, that can, you know, sometimes help um, get in the flow. Um, so hello and welcome to Living with Lions. Uh, the Mountain Lion Foundation's monthly webinar series. Um, I'm Gowan Batiste, and this is Chago. And I am deeply honored to serve as the Coexistence Programs Manager for the Mountain Lion Foundation. And we are a national not-for-profit organization. Our work is focused on ensuring that the ecologically critical mountain lion survives and flourishes in the wild. We do this work in three key ways. Um, we, wherever people live or hike or work in my, mountain lion country, which is historically or currently the entire United States. Um, we offer proactive community-based coexistence trainings and support, helping people keep themselves and their families and their domestic animals safe, while also keeping their lion neighbors safe as well. Second, we work with partners and volunteers and people like you all over the US to advocate at the state and federal levels to ensure that strong protections are in place for mountain lions and their habitats. We stand up for lions wherever they are being overhunted or otherwise persecuted. And that's especially important uh, to make our ecosystems more resilient in the face of climate change. So we also do a lot of educational programming to correct misconceptions about mountain lions and help people and decision makers understand just how important they are and how straightforward and cost effective it can be to coexist peacefully with mountain lions. So with our Living with Lions webinar series, each month we cover a new angle on how people and mountain lions can peacefully coexist. And this month, we are talking about livestock guardian dogs, which are an ancient uh, partner in coexisting with apex predators all over the world. So about me, that is also me and Jago. Um, my name is Gowan, and I work with the Mountain Lion Foundation. And the majority of my work is helping support ranchers and homesteaders in living peacefully alongside uh, mountain lions. Um, I end up working with a lot of people who have adopted livestock guardian dogs and who are having struggles with them or who would like to get started and don't know where to begin. Um, so I have been working with these dogs for about a decade and um, I've I grew up in an agricultural community. My family has had sheep for a very long time. And um, before having livestock guardian dogs, we lost lambs every spring. Since having livestock guardian dogs, we've never had a depredation to coyotes again. And that is a huge deal. <laughs> um, and as well as, you know, being able to coexist peacefully alongside mountain lions, bears, bobcats, really every big North American predator except wolves um, exist where we're currently running sheep. And we're still an active working sheep ranch with about 50 sheep. So the history of these dogs is ancient. It goes back at least 10,000 years. Um, there's some speculation about whether or not the domestication pathway that created these dogs might be different from a lot of other domestic dogs. They're still considered a primitive dog breed. Um, they behave pretty differently than a lot of other domestic dogs do. Um, and there's still very much an integrated modern part of pastoral living all over the world. 
Um, and LGDs are part of culture and community. So this is a picture of a transhumance, which is a movement of flocks from pastures seasonally. So in places that have had these dogs historically for thousands of years, they're an integrated part of the community. People expect to see them. They know how to behave around them. They know how to handle their pet dogs around them. Um, and I think it's interesting as a, a correlation that parts of the world that have historically had these dogs, like Spain, um, like parts of Eastern Europe, um, like Italy, still tend to retain their native predators, um, like wolves and bears um, and big cats. And then places like England that have not historically had these dogs have tended to extirpate their native predators, like wolves and the Eurasian lynx and bears. So there are worldwide success stories of working with these dogs. Um, in the, the resources that will be sent out at the end of this, you'll see links from everywhere from Botswana to Tasmania to right here in the United States. Um, there's a range of success from like 93 to 98% in formal studies, which is more effective than any other single tool that we use. And one of the amazing things, and there's a, there'll be a study linked um, for you to read about this too, is the kind of the landscape ecology. Um, it's often referred to as the ecology of fear that are created by these dogs to where there's almost never any direct interaction between um, these domesticated dogs and wildlife that they can share the same space really effectively because they don't run directly into conflict with each other. I've personally seen a mountain lion on game camera walking on one side of the fence with a livestock guardian dog and sheep on the other. And that dog was watching that mountain lion and that mountain lion was watching that dog and they completely passed each other and nobody got hurt. I've physically seen Chago chase away a mountain lion without ever coming into contact with it. Um, and for that reason, they can be an incredibly powerful tool, um, an incredibly powerful partner. However, like I said, you know, there's been thousands of years of culture built around these dogs in other parts of the world. They've really only become as common as they are in the United States since about the 1970s. So we're trying to catch up with thousands of years of, of custom and culture in a couple of decades. And so, of course, that's really hard to do. And it takes training. Uh, this is uh, Chego and some sheep they're studying. Um, and it takes community buy-in um, and support um, in order for these dogs to be safe, in order for them to be able to be an active part of a working landscape. Um, so something that I want to just mention fairly briefly before we get deep into it is why are we not talking about donkeys and llamas as guardian animals? You will see them sometimes suggested. Unfortunately, they're even sometimes um, advised. Um, we do not recommend donkeys and llamas um, for a couple of reasons. One, I've personally responded to a call where five llamas were killed in one night by a mountain lion. Um, uh, guanacos are really common um, mountain lion prey in Patagonia. They absolutely can eat them. Um, and there's also a study linked um, showing that mountain lions are a major predator of feral donkeys in the Southwest. So first of all, they can be predated on themselves. And then secondly, they're their own animals with their own social needs, nutritional needs, grooming needs, farrier needs. And having a donkey out with a flock of sheep, it's really unlikely any of those needs are going to be met. Um, so while they're great animals in their own right, and they're worthy of being kept for their own selves and taken care of in the ways that they need, um, they're not really a guardian animal the same way that these dogs are. Um, so let's talk about these dogs. So this is Chago, who's right next to me. And this other dog across the way is the, the other dog that we are working with. This is Azra, um, and she's an Anatolian shepherd. Um, so if you can see this video, and watch how they both move. You can see that they're pretty morphologically different. Also, you wanna notice Azra's back leg there. Um, Azra has a condition called post leg where she has overly tight um, ligaments in her back legs. Um, but you can see they look really different. And you can see like the, the dogs with that Kazakh herder look pretty different and that's okay. There's a million different livestock guardian dog breeds and combinations thereof. Um, we're not gonna to get too deep into that because it's mostly not relevant. In the United States, the most common livestock guardian breeds are gonna be Great Pyrenees and Anatolian and combinations of that. Both of these dogs are some sort of cocktail that way. So rescue dogs. Um, so um, 
Chago and Azra are both rescue dogs. And actually every livestock guardian dog that I've ever had has been a rescue dog. And like I said, Chago, we're his third home. And I don't, I don't know exactly how old he is. I don't know exactly where he came from. There's a real crisis um, with livestock guardian dogs in this country um, where breeding of them has kind of gotten ahead of the skill set for how to keep them. Um, they're very commonly showing up in shelters. They're often difficult to rehome because of the needs that they have. Um, there's an article in the resources that talks about that. Um, personally, if somebody is telling me that they're just starting out and they're interested in livestock guardian dogs, they want to get one for their, for their ranch. Um, I would send them to a rescue because you just, you really don't want to start with a puppy. That's going to take two plus years to be able to guard. You want to start with an adult that knows its business and that you know more about. Um, so these are just a couple of rescues at the bottom of the page. Um, your mileage may vary. Um, and, uh, well, I just saw the question come in the Q and R that's, that's a great one. Um, your mileage may vary, you know, you are going to want to check out resources that are near you. Um, Chago didn't come through a formal rescue. Chago came directly from his last home. Um, most of the dogs that I've helped place, um, are fire evacuees, um, because of where I am in Northern California, fires really common reason why people end up closing their ranches. Um, yeah. other, yeah. other things happen, you know, like Azra has post leg, which is a genetic condition that means that she's always right. going to need supplements and more careful vet care. And it might mean she has a shorter working life. Chago came to us with a tick borne illness that is incurable. Um, and he's going to have forever that we have to manage. These things come from having dogs that are rescue dogs. However, <laughs> all of that can be true from breeders as well and um there are quite a few um there's quite a few examples of you know it, it really going both ways there are really ethical breeders there are really unethical breeders there are really ethical rescues there are really unethical rescues but for most people most of the time it's better to start with an experienced older dog and a livestock guardian dog rescue is the way to do that Okay, so that gets into livestock guardian dogs versus herding dogs. And a, a, a common question, which is, can anyone do this? Can any dog do this? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, these dogs have been selected for thousands of years. Um, a pretty fundamental trait of a, of a wolf is a prey drive. And these dogs have been selected not to have one, that they can live with a prey species without eating them. Um, you can't just cross them to any other dog and have them behave the same way. Um, which is, you know, an important thing. And one of the reasons why it's so important to spay and neuter them. It's really common to see rescues that have litters of Great Pyrenees border collie puppies, because a lot of ranches have border collies and a lot of ranches have Great Pyrenees and a lot of ranches don't spay or neuter either. And that cross is not likely to herd well or guard well. Um, they make great pets. I actually know several of them that are fantastic dogs, um, but they're not necessarily likely to do either working job well. So this is Chago leading the flock. And one of the things about these dogs is that the flock bond to them. They see them as part of their community and they'll often follow them. So it's the opposite of what sheep normally do with a dog in the field, which is run away. <laughs> um, when the sheep see Chago going somewhere, they follow. So that can be a great way to actually move the flock. You can call, call him and he'll, you know, he'll go and they'll follow him. So um, that's a big shift in the relationship that dogs normally have with sheep. So when to adopt an LGD? This is Luna, um, who is a very, very sweet girl. And she belongs to one of the ranches that we've, we've worked with um, post depredation. Um, and they have, were, were kind enough to share their story with us um, and, and be willing to have other people benefit from their learning curve. But in, in a very common state of affairs, one of the first things that they did is run out um, following a depredation where one of their animals was killed is run out and adopt a puppy. Um, they got Luna from a breeder. It turned out that Luna was not 12 weeks old. She was actually six weeks old, which is unfortunately really common and, um, and not great. Because that was a hard time going to be away from her mother, even legally in California. 
Um, it takes about two years, um, if you're lucky, for a livestock guardian dog to be ready to fully protect a flock. A puppy this young is more likely to be at risk of depredation themselves than to actually protect your flock. Um, we really recommend that people interested in and ready to have an LGD in their lives um, adopt an adult. Um, and that when you're ready to adopt a puppy, it needs to come with all the regular training that puppies require, um, but also protection and a safe place to be um, until they're actually old enough to fend for themselves. So should working dogs be friendly? Um, there's a, a kind of mythos in America that these dogs should be unapproachable. I really disagree with that. Um, I think that a dog that is not domesticated is a wolf. Um, and that's not what we're going for here. Um, I think that these dogs should be integrated members of the ranch family, the way that they are traditionally in parts of the world where they've been used for millennia. Um, this is Azra, who is a very hardcore livestock guardian dog, um, a very, very serious girl. And she just met this person. Um, but, you know, he's not a coyote and he's not trying to eat the sheep. So she's not worried. Um, discernment is really important. Um, how I feel about livestock guardian dogs is you should be able to walk into the field with anybody. And if they're with you, then they're not going to get barked at. They're not going to get menaced. That that dog understands the difference between what's a threat and what's not. And unfortunately, you'll see a lot of ranches where these dogs are not socialized and where they really don't. And um, that's, that's a problem that needs to change. That makes things not safe for the community and not safe for the dogs. Um, big dogs and small lambs. Um, this often takes um, another level of training. Um, it took Azra a couple of seasons of just observing um, before she was allowed to directly interact with lambs. Um, and there's a, a reason that you might not expect, which is um, they actually might bond with them too hard and steal them from their moms. Um, so that takes some time. But one of the great things you know, this is Chago when he was much younger with a little gaggle of lambs and the ewes are off screen left um, grazing. And he just acts like a babysitter where he is taking care of them while the moms are off, you know, having having some mom time. And that's really important. You know, the lambs will magnetize to these dogs. <laughs> um, I have actually counted lambs and come up short and you know, gotten worried only to realize that I had counted one short because there was a little white lamb that had disappeared into Chago's fur. Um, so again, the, the core of why these dogs guard, why they do what they do is because they bond to you as the shepherd and they bond to the flock. It is all about belonging. It's all about oxytocin. It's all about relationship. So with Chago now, I feel really confident with him, but with a younger dog, um, if you were going to introduce new livestock, um, they don't necessarily have a bond with that livestock. And you need to have a process in mind for how you're going to make that introduction um, because they will not necessarily accept sheep they don't know. They bond with each individual. Um, so a sheep is not a fungible thing to them where each one is, is like the other. Um, this is Luna again, learning about poultry. Um, because of what I just said about the guardian relationship, um, it's important to mention that sh they don't bond upon the poultry that way, generally speaking. They're not mammals. The dogs know they're not mammals. They can learn how to protect them, but they usually don't um, bond with them as, as well, which means that it usually takes a little longer um, and takes more training. Um, because to most dogs, even livestock guardian dogs, especially young dogs, a chicken is kind of a squeaky toy. Um, that said, I know lots of really amazing bird dogs. They just take, they're, they're like a 201. They're not usually where people start with livestock guardian dogs. So um, any time of stress, you'll see the sheep go right to the dog. So if they're, if they're getting vetted, you know, if they're getting vaccines and hoof trims, um, they will, they will come and cling to this dog. Um, that's Madge kind of draping herself over Chago. Um, they have a particularly tight bond. Um, and this is her in labor, <laughs> um, which forgive the low quality photo, but um, they are, uh, she spent her whole labor just like draped across him. And he was a really, really great sport about it. He stayed right with her. 
Um, and that's, that's the kind of amazing nature of this bond. And, um, you know, it's, it's really not like anything else. And it's, it's very precious in of itself and rare. Um, so uh, I've just told you how amazing they are. Um, but what are some of the considerations and downsides and what will the neighbors think? Um, this is Chago. Um, Chago's favorite thing to do um, anytime it rains is dig a, a hole uh, so that he can make a mud wallow. Um, you do have to take care of their coats. Um, he has a trip to the groomer tomorrow. Um, but, you know, in general, like, it's really important to be aware of, like, what is, what, how does the community interact with these dogs? Um, I got an email from a community listserv um, just yesterday about, you know, oh, there's loose dogs in this field. Um, and they're my neighbor's livestock guardian dogs, and they're supposed to be in that field. And so the rancher came on the listserv and was like, those are my dogs. The flock is in that field. They're supposed to be there. It's okay. Um, but that is often a reaction that people have if they see a, a dog by itself, um, even if it's with a flock of sheep. Um, these dogs also bark. They bark a lot. They bark territorially. Um, and depending on where you are, if you're in a right to farm area and you're zoned agriculture, that may be protected. That may be a protected agricultural activity um, th that's been litigated a few times. Like there was a case where a livestock guardian dog was protecting an apple orchard from bears and um, a judge ruled that that was an agricultural use of that dog and that dog was allowed to be out at night barking. But people who are homesteading or who have, you know, a backyard kind of a flock situation who live in a residential area, you're still liable for barking dog regulations, which means the dog needs to come inside at night so it's not keeping your neighbors awake. And, and really they should not be trained not to bark at night. It is how they establish their perimeter. It's how they don't have conflicts. Um, and sometimes you'll see people do horrible, horrible things like put barking collars on them and that should never be done. So fencing. It is not that easy to contain these dogs. <laughs> They're notorious for being able to get out of anything. The fence this dog is in is definitely not adequate. Um, this dog is probably staying in the fence because that's where the sheep are. So sometimes the bond of the flock is more um, useful than the fencing. Um, my, um, <laughs> my dog has uh, actually jumped, um, the Azra has jumped fence to chase a bear away and then jumped back in to get in with the flock. And I did change the fence after that to make her not be able to do that. But that's how much they care about um, staying with the flock. Um, a general guideline for these dogs is that the fence should be at least five feet high um, and needs to be secured to the ground. So roaming. So they might feel that their territory is square miles. And very few of us live on a ranch that is square miles anymore. So this is our neighbor's dog, Shasta. She's a very good girl. Those are our sheep. Those are not Shasta's sheep. <laughs> Shasta has done this multiple times and she's so pleased with herself. I mean, look how happy she is um, that she came to pretend her Um, However, she had to cross a highway to get to our place. Um, so, you know, we actually went over and helped fix their fence so that this didn't happen again because, you know, she could easily be killed on the highway. It could easily cause a car accident that could injure or or kill a person, God forbid. Um, so roaming is a is a pretty serious issue with these dogs. Um, it's very important to have them licensed, vaccinated, um, microchipped. It's very important to have phone numbers on their collars. Almost everybody who has a livestock guardian dog is going to have a roaming incident at least once, you know, despite the, the best efforts, they are really, really dedicated roamers. Um, <laughs> it's probably the scariest part of having these dogs, honestly. Um, so I would love to see advancements in um, GPS collar technology. For most people who are working with these dogs, they're not, that's not really viable because um, uh, they, they have short battery lives. Um, health and nutrition, these are athletes. Um, they need to have giant dog breed specific food and supplements. Um, vetting, they have to be able to go to the vet. So many people who have these dogs, the dogs never see the vet. 
Um, we're a working ranch, so we can give our own vaccines. Um, so we don't need to go to the vet for everything, but they still need a physical at least once a year. They still need dental work. They still need blood tests. Um, so being able to load up in the car and go to the vet is, uh, is, is crucial. And um, often you see dogs that have never been to the vet. Um, you need to have a plan for recovery. Um, this is a neighbor's dog post uh, neuter. And injuries from conflict. This is Chago, the one time he actually has been in a physical altercation, um, which uh, was roaming domestic dogs, attacking sheep. And you can see the blue on, on his butt. That's from um, a treatment that has an eye in it that uh, ranch vets use. And so you need to have a plan for like, where does the dog recover? What happens to the rest of the livestock in the meantime? Um, and how you're gonna manage that and how your budget is. Um, I think pet insurance is absolutely critical for these large dogs. Um, somebody, um, I was talking about this too er earlier, quoted usually around like $500 to do a dental for dogs this size, which is why ins the pet insurance is like very, very much worth it. So when those big expenses happen, the insurance kicks in. Aging. So my partner and I rescued this dog um, off the middle of a, um, a rural highway, 55 mile an hour highway that this old dog was just walking right down the middle of, um, had clearly been on its own for a while, underweight, had a broken leg, um, was very happy to get picked up and taken to a, to a vet. Um, so planning for aging. So Chago's retirement plan is uh, to be with us. And, and he can be because he is approachable, um, because he's handleable, because he is a dog who's been trained and treated as a dog, um, who hasn't been just left um, completely bereft of that training. Um, evacuation during fire is really important. Being here in Northern California, this is us evacuating. You can see Chago's in the top left and Azra's in the top right. Um, many of these dogs get left behind. Some of them lose their lives. Uh, many of them lose their homes in fire. Um, having these dogs as a member of the ranch through the years is like the most rewarding thing that I really do, even though it's incredibly hard. Um, this is Chago many years ago with a little lamb. And this is Chago many years later with that same lamb that's now an elderly sheep and with our little new baby. And this is Chago with us and with some goats hanging out. You know, um, being an integrated part of the ranch life and the family. Um, and that's something that's very important to us. It's very important to us to keep mountain lions safe, to keep native carnivores safe, to keep domestic animals safe, but not to do it at the expense of the quality of life of these dogs. And that you really can have it, you know, both ways. So that is reaching the end of our formal presentation. This is Chago in his retirement mode, um, hanging out. Um, I see that we've got some questions in the Q&A. Um, feel free to <laughs> feel free to populate um, the chat and Q&A here. Let's see. Okay, so Julie is asking, um, are the Pyrenees instinctively ready for training um, as adults? Um, are they ready for training as adults? So I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, so to, um, to back up, um, Great Pyrenees are instinctively ready to learn how to, how to guard, yeah. Um, which is a reason why um, it can be a little bit more challenging to have them be house pets or from a shelter. So if you get a Great Pyrenees from a shelter that's an adult, can you train them as an LGD? Sometimes, yeah. Um, the best case scenario is to get a Great Pyrenees from a livestock guardian dog rescue that's already evaluated them and that's already tested them with livestock. Um, that isn't always possible to do because there are always more of these dogs in the shelter that can't get pulled by private rescues. Um, I think that it's, that, that yes, they all have this instinct. They don't all have the foundation. Um, for someone who's a first timer, I would absolutely send them to a rescue that's already done all that temperament testing and training. Um, and there's quite a few out there. 
Um, you know, as for a dog like Chago, um, part of it's training, most of it's instinct. Um, okay, can you talk a little more about other animals being used as guardian animals? Um, sure, so there are a lot of kind of anecdotal, I don't wanna call them myths necessarily, but, um, you know, there have been attempts to, you know, keep smaller, more vulnerable, vulnerable livestock in mixed herds with larger cows that have horns, thinking that they will be more intimidating as a target. Um, llamas, donkeys, um, those are, those are really the two most popular ones you're going to see in the U.S. Um, personally, I really don't recommend any of them. Um, donkeys in general, they don't tend to be protective as much as they tend to be aggressive. So if you have coyotes, um, come into a field that are, that has a donkey in it, the donkey might go attack the coyote, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they care about the sheep. Um, they might trample the sheep in the process. Um, I also do personally know a, um, a farm that had a mass killing of sheep, um, by feral dogs um in a field that had three guardian donkeys in it so um you know um okay so when correctly trained and friendly does the roaming behavior decrease with age um yes i have found that um however if the dogs get really old and confused they can do that too like that that poor old guy um but in general yeah um i i have i've found that to be true but none of them are foolproof for roaming, not even Chago. And so you still really want to have your fencing together and you want to have your fallbacks, which are your, your microchipping, um, always being current with your licensing and have your phone numbers on the dog. Um, okay. So how should the public act when you see grazing projects? We live in suburbia, so we see goats and sheep in the neighborhood sometimes. My kiddo loves to watch them, but so does my dog. What are the best practices if we stop at a working farm or see fire reduction grazing on our walks with our high prey drive dog? That is a great question. Um, so as, especially where we live, again, in fire prone Northern California, um, grazing on a community level is more and more common where you will see these flocks, um, sometimes along the freeways. Um, sometimes closer to the kind of urban wildlife boundary, which is also where, you know, there's increasing conflicts with mountain lions there. Um, I think it's very important. Um, first of all, if they're in fence that is portable, it's likely electric, which means you don't want to touch it. If you ever see a dog that looks injured or that looks like it's not where it's supposed to be, the first and best course of action would be to get in touch with the rancher. And oftentimes, like this community listserv question, they will really proactively be trying to put their information out there for the community. Um, they'll often be signage um, with their contact information on it um, at the grazing site. I've worked as a fire mitigation grazer, and we always did that, where we would have you know, multiple step-in signs with our contact information and with basic information like, please don't touch the fence. Please don't try to reach over the fence to touch animals. And please do not let your dog bark at or harass the sheep. And um, which might mean that you need to take a different route than you normally take on your walk. And it might be an inconvenience, but the flocks are there to try to keep the community safe from wildfire. And the dogs are there to keep the sheep safe while they're doing it. Um, a great Pyrenees livestock dog might see your small dog as a threat to the sheep. Um, and might come over and get in a big barking match with you. Um, let's see. So I've mentioned recommending new owners adopting an adult LGD, but does that ha hamper the bonding? Um, I do feel like it's a myth that an LGD must grow up with the flock that it's pr protecting. So the the sheep that Chago was having that very adorable cuddle fest with, Madge, both before and, and during her labor, um, you know, we adopted Madge from a, a, an elderly couple that was, you know, letting go of their sheep. Um, she had met Chago probably six months before that picture was taken. They can bond with new animals. They don't have to grow up with them. Um, it's important that you have a process for integration, especially when they're younger, which might look like having them in parallel fences and taking the dog into the flock on leash at first. Um, but they, they can absolutely bond with new animals. They do it all the time. Um, so let's see. Um, 
So what are your thoughts about a rescue adult LGD with no history of training? Um, I would get one from a rescue that's already evaluated that. Um, because in, in general, that's going to, those questions have already been answered. So anonymous attendee, is government funding available to purchase a guardian dog? There are um, programs such as the Texas a and um, has a guardian dog program that do provide government funding to place these dogs on ranches for any purposes. Um, I don't know of any national projects like that. Um, there are programs in other countries that do that, like um, in Botswana. Um, I think it's something that there needs to be more adoption for, for sure. There's, there's definitely um, space there. Um, and Rand, and uh, let's see, Jane, do you recommend more than one LGD to prevent mountain lion predation? In general, um, I think two is kind of a minimum because then if one needs to recover from spay and neuter or gets injured or needs to go to the, the vet for a physical or whatever, you're not leaving the sheep completely alone. Um, I have seen one dog successfully deter a mountain lion, but they also can't be everywhere. Um, on really large ranches, you'll sometimes see these dogs pretty much working in packs. Um, but, you know, I, I do I do feel like two is a good number, but it's also important for their ages to be staggered. Um, there are mixed feelings about this. Some people think that the effect is sort of overblown and hyperbolized, but there's something called... Um, litter mate syndrome, which is if you raise two puppies together, they'll tend to bond to each other and not the sheep. And I've kind of anecdotally noticed that that does seem to be the case, that you have more issues. Um, so while you might want to have two dogs, um, you want to have their ages be staggered and you want to work on training them as individuals. Um, so would guardian dogs be able to watch cattle um, to keep them safe from wolves? Um, they're certainly able to. Cattle in general seem like less um, accepting of them than sheep are. Um, a, a way that you might, you know, you might implement that might be bringing the cattle in closer during calving um, and having a dog um, on the margins, but not actually in the pen with them. Um, it really depends on your cattle. Um, in general, um, there's some amazing footage of this and in, in a few different spots online of um, livestock guardian dogs um, establishing and holding territory and keeping it separate from wolf packs. The same thing has been seen in Australia with dingoes. Um, so they certainly can be an effective deterrent from wolves. Um, it's really just a matter of, you know, will the cattle accept them? <laughs> um, let's see here. Yeah, the National Great Pyrenees Rescue is fantastic. Um, so do you share dogs or recommend sharing them? Like uh, you know, like the neighbor dog that crossed the highway. Um, I have, um, when working on a contract grazing operation, um, shared dogs, um, moving different dogs around at, at different times of the year um, or in specific projects. Um, in general, I think keeping them as um, grounded um, in the flock that they're part of, um, as possible is, is great. Um, and, you know, I've also done that and not had a problem, um, with it. Um, however, having the neighbor's dog crossing the highway to get in with our sheep is, is, you know, not great. Um, but it is pretty great that, you know, she knows us, she knows our flock, she knows Chago. I can just go in and put her on a leash and take her home. Um, so if, you know, if you're someone who's working in a neighborhood where there are working LGDs, establishing a relationship with them is always a good thing. Um, so, um, do they make good pets on an urban small lot? I have mixed feelings about that. Um, they tend to be very quiet in the house. Um, you know, Azra is a very, very serious livestock guardian dog. Um, she is incredibly protective of her flock. Um, she's never lost a charge. Um, but when you bring her in the house, it, aliens could land on the front lawn and she wouldn't care because she's not on duty. You know, she just curls up and, you know, she's, she's in shutdown mode, you know. Um, people can have them as pets. Um, however, they 
are not like a border collie or a golden retriever. They tend to be not as easy to train um, and they do tend to roam um, and they do have exercise needs. Um, I think they're an amazing dogs and that same bonding and guarding that they do with livestock, they can do with your kids. They can do with your cats, you know, um, they're very, very worthy of rescue, even though, um, some of them that ha have never been exposed to livestock are probably not going to make the transition well later in life. That doesn't mean they won't be great pets. Um, so I have a lot of, um, respect for them, um, I think that if you were going to adopt them to live on a small lot, your fencing would need to be immaculate and you'd need to be really committed to their exercise. Um, but that's true of just about any dog. Um, I think as long as your um, understanding of their kind of unique needs and temperament, there's no reason not to go for it. Um, so, hey, thank you all so much um, for uh, <laughs> coming to this really, um, uh, kind of off the ball discussion and putting up with me kind of getting, you know, cuddle bombed the whole time. Um, I really, um, I really appreciate you all. Um, you know, mountain lions are the center of what we do, and this is a little bit of a departure from that, but remember, you know, this is all part of the kind of tools of the trade of how we keep the mountain lions safe. Um, so I appreciate you turning into this living with lions webinar. Um, we have members in all 50 States and around the world. The mountain lion foundation's work is funded by you. Um, individuals who care about mountain lions, their habitats, and the world we share with them. If you are not already supporting our work, you can become a member at mountainlion.org. On our website, you can also learn more about these amazing animals, find out how to be an advocate for mountain lions in your community. Um, our next webinar is a really exciting one. It's learn how to get started with camera trapping to discover the wildness in your own backyard. Um, with Dr. Hari Viswanathan, has been an amateur wildlife photographer for 30 years using his lens to document hundreds of animals around the globe. April's Living with Lions webinar will equip you with the knowledge and inspiration to finally set up that first trail camera. I'm really looking forward to it. I use trail cameras in my work um, at the Mountain Lion Foundation, but Hari has turned it into an art form. Um, and I, uh, I really recommend tuning in. So thank you all so much. Chago says thank you. And remember, um, we've got that uh, resource link um so there's uh there's more information out there this is the shallowest dip into a huge pond um so please like follow that link check out the resources we have listed there are many more um and remember you can always reach out um if you're having coexistence concerns or questions um so thank you all so much and we will see you next time <laughs>